Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Just wait until the last ones are in. Yeah, that that's pain arriving. Yeah, so it's a yes, it's a, yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Faru. I think. Uh, Okay, I, I see that the atmosphere is really in, uh, how do you say, in uh, these big events. Holly, come on, help me, I'm tired, so I think I'm already tired. So. Good afternoon, it's very strange, it's very strange. After two years, many people, I'm, I've noticed already in the corridors, a few of you, uh, that I know this part, you see, and all of a sudden there is a whole part be below it as well, which is very nice because all of a sudden, you become also real people. And it, I think that's the key thing of this kind of international programs, is the fact that we meet each other. And that's also the reason why we organize this kind of events, is, uh, the re is that we meet each other and that we are able to learn from each other and also uh, spend some great time uh, together. Um, for those that have never seen me, I'm Tim, uh, currently still the coordinator of this uh, crazy master program. Um, so the name of the program, for those that don't know it by heart yet, is uh, the acronym is IMBSC. This stands for the International Master of Science in Marine Biological Resources. I just repeat this because a few guests that are here uh, can then use this also for their uh, uh, other speeches, for example, and that is a refresher of uh, uh, the minds as well. So diving into uh, marine minds, it's um, in total uh, the third time that we organize this symposium in person with uh, uh, we did of course two events online which were totally not the same but I'm very glad for those that will also present their theses here uh, this year uh, that uh, that at least they have also the physical opportunity those from last year actually yeah, they could only do this kind of uh, virtual events which were great of course yeah uh, but still I think there is a, a slight difference good um, I'm very glad that I can open this uh, symposium. Uh, symposium, uh, there will be a full week with uh, tons and different of activities. And I would like to really invite you all, both teachers, uh, students, uh, whoever actually plays a role in this, in this uh, event, to take out the most possible that you can uh, from it. Yeah? Uh, so if there's exhibitions from, from first year students, really attend them because for the first year students it's great to learn from your feedback. If there's uh, uh, thesis presentations, those from the first year for example, really go to these uh, thesis presentations so you can already be get a bit stressed for next year what it is uh, that you have to expect there, because uh, they always say the quality is extremely high, and so that's, that's indeed the case. So uh, you will see what it is, and you will be able to uh, interact as well. And I really would like to invite you now already to interact and to participate. So, and that's a bit strange to many other master programs. If we ask, for example, the audience, is there any questions, yeah, then it's not only the purpose that those uh, older people, if I can call them like that, that are in the first row, for example, that it's only those who can ask questions. Totally not. The aim is here that you question each other, yeah, also on the thesis presentations, on the professional practices, during workshops, etc., or during the final party. That's also perfectly okay that you ask questions to each other, but then maybe less scientific questions. Good. I just want to start... Okay, diving into me, that's clear. With this picture. I think very, very few of us, actually, I think uh, Karim and me, I think we're a fear, we're actually the o only ones that remain. That's a picture taken in 2008, yeah, 2008. Uh, in September 2008, when uh, uh, one day after I landed for the first time in my life here in Faro on the airport. 
Yeah, it was the first time in my life I landed. Today I landed again. The airport has, a bit, has grown a little bit, but Ria Formosa, etc., all these things uh, are still very much the same. And uh, the university, let's say the buildings, the atmosphere here is also still the same, which means it's a good atmosphere because we keep on coming back here. I think that's uh, an important thing. So what you see here is the first group of students that actually were in Faro taking the EMBC program at the time. Yeah? Uh, and this is the, the one third of the total group of students that there were at that time. Uh, of course, there were also people in Belgium and in Bremen. And so what you see here was the total population of students that we had at the time. Things have changed a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the nice thing, again, is that many of these people here, yeah, if you would start looking their names up, you will see that they have PhDs, that they have teaching positions, that they are all over the world, yeah, that they spread out. People from Belgium live now, for example, also in France, those kind of things. Uh, so at, at, uh, I'm just making a joke here to somebody that was not listening from the teachers. Um, so uh, there were people, uh, for example, that took part also in the Maris program, then people that went to Galway, and actually through this, this, these people from different nationalities, yeah, we kind of were able to grow uh, a network, uh, a huge network of universities and uh, people. Anybody an idea what this is? No, it's another memory, and a memory that uh, takes me back three years ago. Actually, Olivier, you should know what this is all about, because this is a part from a comic, yeah, An Ocean d'Amour. I don't know if you know this comic, if you don't know it, there's not a single French word in it, so if you don't speak French, it's perfectly okay, but it's beautiful. And it's about love for the ocean, but also love over the ocean, love for the sea, and how this influences also our personal lives uh, at all different levels. If we go at sea for several uh, months, for example, and we're away from our families, for example, this has a strong impact. And I really recommend you this comic, if you can find it somewhere in a bookshop in Brest. I bought it in a, in a bookshop in Brest during the annual symposium. It's lovely. I just, I think, and it's kind of also um, making a summary of what this program is about. It's about a, a love for the ocean. I think that's, that's a key thing, but it's also uh, all the things that are connected to it, uh, to it. We travel, we meet other people, and actually over the ocean, we connect to different uh, people. So this is a memory for me from the uh, uh, annual symposium in Brest. So that was then, at the time, we invented that fantastic name then, Diving into Marine Mines, so still, still the same name. We're very original in that. And that was the program, as you see it uh, appearing there. So you will see that the program is very close to what the program you will be experiencing here in Farold. So the only difference is a little bit the temperature. Um, what else is different? Uh, we will see in the next coming week. So it will be, so now it's a bit the challenge between universities, eh? which one organizes the best uh, annual symposium. So that's the idea behind it. Next year, it's another event. Eh? And then you can actually vote in the end. It's still voting for where the next uh, conference will be. Good. Um, I just start with a bit of art, yeah, a comic. I don't know, just a quiz. Which type of art is this? Whose art is this? Ah, okay, at least some people that know it, very good. Yeah, another question, what species do you see here? Not the teachers, the teachers you're not allowed to answer because you know the answer. Come on, you're a marine biologist, it's a marine species. Nobody that dares to, I, at least the order should be possible. Yeah. Eh? Mise it, mise it, yeah, mise it, yeah. Uh, perfect, yeah, it's a lovely organism. Uh, I, I studied a lot on these organisms, but I, from time to time I just put uh, people back to the, the beauty of these creatures, and it's about the beauty of the ocean. That's a bit the link that I want to make. So, but don't forget, yeah, if you want to chat with me, you can start chatting about mise shrimps and misida, a fantastic order. Look it up on the internet, marinespecies.org, and you will learn uh, a lot about it.
Good. I just uh, next picture because I'm a bit artistic today. That, that's good. Uh, uh, I hope you know this. This is fantastic. That's in the Caribbean. That's uh, an underwater actually sculpture exhibition. For people that dive, for example, it's, it's the place to be if you want to have uh, uh, marine life combined with uh, people. I just put this picture here to show also, for example, the connection between people, but also to explain you a bit as an intro to, uh, okay, that you get a bit an idea of who is here in the room. And I'm uh, going to ask you in a minute just to brief you say your names, and by the end of the event, you should know all these names by heart. So that's the idea behind it. <laughs> I'm joking, yeah. Now, what you see on the map here, on the map are actually uh, is an overview map of all the people that are here in the room yeah, and their hometowns. So that shows you immediately yeah, where do people come from. In total, help. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry that I make you homesick, that's not the aim. Yeah, uh, but in total, we have here uh, 42 nationalities in this room, 42 nationalities, which is huge. Yeah, uh, over a population of uh, around 200 people that are here, 42 nationalities. And here, uh, so uh, if you go home, if you want to put something on your Facebook, for example, that's the kind of things you have to put on your Facebook. And so you can tell your friends, look, I've been in a room with 42 uh, nationalities in order to help to spread COVID also in an international way. <laughs> I like data. And I like to present data in original ways. Yeah? And uh, I thought this is actually quite a, a cute one, a funny one, because what you see here is a, a graph. If you start looking at this graph, for the people that present their theses in the coming days, very important that you explain what is on the axis, that you also explain okay, what is shown on the graph, and that you explain in the end what it is about. So now I give a hint. If you forget to explain this during your thesis presentation, you will be scored very badly. So what you have down there is birth years of students. Yeah. We have female population and we have the male population. And that's, again, you. Eh? We're looking at who is here in this room. So what you see is that, OK, we have a bigger group of females. The colors, again, represent different nationalities. Yeah. What is very funny, if I look at this, and now my artistic uh, feeling comes up again, is that I see fish in it. How is this possible that the shape of a fish is even represented in the population of students that we have around here? Yeah. OK, so it's a, uh, don't worry. Eh? So that's, a no they call it normal distributions. Yeah, it's nothing to do with uh, fish. Anyway, let's move on a bit because now you know who is here but not yet fully and in a minute I will ask actually all the different representatives from the universities to briefly say hello I'm this person so you know also uh, who you have to address for example if next year you want to go somewhere for example to, to do uh, a second year uh, uh, internship or whatever, or your, sorry, your mobility is at the second year. I just show you this program, because now I get back a little bit serious, yeah, uh, with a lot of different activities. Now, if people ask me from time to time, okay, what is this master program about, then it's actually quite difficult to say. It's about marine biological resources, yeah. But what does that mean? And I think what we have here on the program is an excellent representation. We have workshops, we have uh, professional practices where students are interacting, and also we have thesis presentations with lots of different topics. Now, what I did, actually, I made a, uh, a word cloud, yeah, of all the topics, yeah, for both uh, professional practices as thesis, and then you see immediately, if you look at this, what are the topics that are appearing most. So, and mostly, you should also see words from your professional practice or your thesis, because unless you have a title with ND, D, N, UN, so only the, the non-meaningful words, yeah. So, but if you want to have a summary of our program, that's a summary of our program. With that, I mean it's about marine biological, biological resources, but we do a lot of different things, which is the strength of the program, uh, but sometimes also the difficulty because it's often hard to explain to each other, okay, what are we doing? But it's key that we at least we also listen to each other on that. 
We have different universities. Yeah, hooray, you know them already, the different universities by heart. Uh, you should know them by heart. No, what is great during this event is that we also have representatives from each university here. So you can really chase each university. If you're not happy with a certain professor, then you can, yeah, uh, you know how to direct. If you're happy, and I think that's key as well, if you're happy with your experience that you had or the experience that has come, dare also to go to the people and say, ah, it was great. Or uh, so try to give a feedback also to the teachers because also for them it's important uh, because without teachers, of course, no program. Good, let me start with those that came in latest, yeah, the people from Oviedo. Oviedo. Can you briefly just say who you are so they can, uh, people can also address you? Is there more hidden teachers from Oviedo somewhere? No? Yeah. Then we can move to University of the Basque country. Okay. We follow the coastline and we go up, and we go up to Brest. Then it's tricky because there is an island. So what do we do with islands? Eh? So no, no, no. I'm joking. Uh, we have. Uh, it's not GMIT anymore, but I'm. I, I don't know by heart. So the people from Galway can just uh, uh, introduce themselves. Okay, then we go to Bergen, Norway. Hi. Ah, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, and then we move down to uh, a, a beautiful place yeah, where this summer a lot of you will go, at least to part of it, it's in the University of Gothenburg. And we move down to yeah, the lovely city of Ghent, Ghent University. So from Ghent University, we have also a few people. Yes. Then we have uh, Diana. What? Yeah. And I don't know if Tim is here. 
Not me, ah ja, der, ja. Then we have also Rodrigo from the GAN team. <laughs> just thinking of not messing any people from Gant, eh? no, just to be sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then we move down to Sorbonne, Sorbonne University. Now we go to Côte d'Azur. Now we move to Ancona, Polytechnic University de la Marche. Uh, not yet arrived. Yeah. There's some problems with planes. Yeah, so some people are still arriving, so yeah. Um, if they arrive, we will they will wear an Italian flag. That's how you will recognize them. And then finally, of course, University of the Algarve, yeah, with a lot of representatives here, luckily. There's, there's some more people. One of the teachers of Faro will give a talk in a minute, so that's, that's also great, but I think she will present and also herself. But we also have then uh, people from the international office here, people from the rectorate. Uh, um, I don't know, maybe, why not? Just also maybe good to present yourself so that students, if they see you on campus, that they know, ah, oh, this is this person I have to say hello to. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Paolo. Oh, and, oh, oh, you are recording, okay. Um, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, team, thank you uh, for this invitation and also to Luana. Welcome to all of you, to, to the delegates, for our colleagues, the, the professor from, from the, the, the different uh, universities that puts this, uh, um, or that makes this amazing program, leading by my team, and I, uh, I have to express my gratitude to Karim and the local uh, organizers and I hope that you can have a, a, a great week uh, in a place where we say that study and research where you'd like to live so and I hope that at the, at the end of the week you can you can say that it was a great experience that the um, practice the thesis were uh, perfect and um, all the best to you um, and uh, have fun and work during this week thank you very much okay, thank you very much I don't know whether other people from Faro you want to, it's okay, good, it's okay. yeah, <laughs> there's many more people, eh? yeah, good. Um,
maybe just this, this graph as well. It's a graph that may, you may know, but I, just to let you know. So the 2020 edition, yeah, the white ones are the ones that are uh, graduating uh, this summer. Yeah, and the 2021 edition, actually, it's the ones that will present their thesis. What, what we see here is not the fish shape yet, yeah, uh, which is sometimes causing a little bit of, um, uh, call it ner nervosity uh, among the consortium. Before next year, for example, we go over that 120 number as well. So um, uh, just to let you know, so next year we will have even more students that will uh, sit together. So the university that will organize the event next year, yeah, we need a big auditorium. That's, that's clear, I think, from this. Good. Um, if we organize these kind of things, we really have to be grateful as well and thank people. And that's also what I want to do here. First of all, I think we have to thank the uh, European Commission, yeah, because this program is an Erasmus Mundus program. So it means also we receive some funding, we receive support, we are working in a framework. So it's my duty, and I think uh, that's more than correct to thank uh, Erasmus Mundus. University of the Algarve, we already thanked them for, for hosting us together with CCMR, uh, the research institution here. So thank you very much for um, letting us making the campus unsafe for the coming uh, days. And I also want to thank EMBRC, so the uh, European Marine Biological Research, uh, um, Marine Biological, uh, come on, I'm a resources center, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. It's standing there. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, they will be here tomorrow as well to give uh, workshops as well, and they're also supporting uh, us as a program uh, overall. So also a big thank you already, I think, uh, to the coordination team. So this uh, event would have not have been possible without lots of hours of preparations, lots of emails, lots of other kind of things, uh, because um, this may seem easy and you also only see one side of it uh, as a student, but organizing this kind of things with so many activities uh, is not uh, far from easy. So uh, I just would like to express my gratitude to uh, the coordination team. Luana, Rodrigo, Diana, Tempt Kent I put because it's very strange to thank myself. Uh, and also the people, the local people also in, uh, in, in Portugal, Karim and Marlene from the uh, international office that helped us uh, in order to set up uh, this event. Also the coordinators you just were introduced from each university. Um, they don't do this just listening here, being here, just because they are paid extremely wealthy for it. No, it's just because they believe in the program, they believe in you and they want to interact with you. So thank you very much for being here, for keeping on being here, and for, for uh, investing in these uh, young people here. Um, also the local uh, staff, uh, I see people in the back there that are uh, making sure this is streamed and that thesis events will uh, be streamed. People that will make sure there is food and that the food is also labeled correctly, those kind of things. Uh, people that uh, will make sure from time to time there is also a coffee break, etc., etc. So uh, we should not forget that it's not only teachers, yeah, but making sure the program runs needs a whole multitude of people that make sure that everything is organized well. And then also for tomorrow, the workshop organizers for people that come pass by to evaluate your, your thesis, to evaluate your professional practice, uh, also from distance, I think it's important that we say thank you to these people. So thank you to these people. I think we should give an applause even when it's streamed. Uh, uh. Good. Um, it's not always happiness. In uh, programs like this, uh, a few weeks ago, actually, we received the news that one of your fellow students uh, passed away. Um, Greg is uh, no longer among us. Yeah? He uh, was planning to present his thesis here uh, during this annual symposium. And actually, I would like to uh, already pay one minute of silence as a, as a, an honor to Greg. Yeah? In the coming days, uh, during the exhibition, we also will put up a book yeah, in which you can write uh, a message to his parents, his girlfriend, uh, and that we will send them uh, uh, in order that we can show also as a program that we live uh, also uh, with him in our hearts. So maybe it's good to stand up and 
at least pay one minute of silence. Thank you very much. So during the professional practice exhibition, I really invite you to leave also a message to his family, to his relatives, uh, to show that uh, uh, he had also an international family uh, around him. Good. Let me come back to some practicalities. Yeah, some practicalities this afternoon. So. Uh, just to let you know where we are now, uh, we're in the, the middle section there, two o'clock has passed, we are given the introduction to the event, and uh, in a minute we will have uh, Esther Serral who will give a uh, first a keynote, yeah, I switched a bit the program uh, for some practicalities as well, uh, and after the talk of Ster, I would like to invite you to go all outside, yeah, where we will take a group picture, yeah a group picture of the, the total group that is here. Those that are not yet here, yeah, then we will do some uh, uh, gimping on them, so we will uh, add some uh, faces uh, to it. So the group picture has a, a break in between, because then after that break, we will have also a second part of the, the opening thing. After um, the, 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 the thing from Siena, yeah, we will then, I will explain then also a lot of uh, practical details, really practicalities, uh, by when do I have to upload certain things, where have to be uh, for other occasions, etc., etc. This is actually the only uh, event in this whole symposium where we're for sure yeah, all together. Because from tomorrow onwards, there will be uh, workshops going on, there will be uh, exhibitions, etc., etc. So that's also why we thought it's good to know have a group picture rather than yeah, somewhere in between. And if you don't find the, the way anymore back to uh, uh, this campus, for example, if you're lost uh, somewhere in between, that at least you can show that you have been here at this uh, event. So what now? Time. Uh, we already ha heard your welcoming words, unless you want to uh, uh, say more. That's, uh, thank you very much for, for the welcoming words from, from the rector from this uh, university. But it's also now my honor to introduce you to Ster Serrao, who actually um, in 2008, yeah, I still remember when I came here the first time, she was already here also as one of the teachers at that time already of the first group of students that I showed you uh, uh, on the first uh, picture. So Ster is, you can say, uh, the most cited uh, uh, marine biology from marine biologist from the whole of Portugal. I can, I think, uh, that's at least what Karim said. Uh, that's for sure true. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, in 2017, for example, she got also uh, a marine fellow from the Pew uh, uh, Foundation. Yeah, and that's also this organization, uh, Daniel Poli. This, this name may say, say you something. If it doesn't say you something, yeah, then you have to maybe do a reset from uh, marine ecology or from fisheries, because it's quite an important name in uh, fisheries ecology. Uh, Ster has lots of PhD students. She was also active in the Maris doctoral program, for example, uh, that we coordinated here many years ago. And uh, her uh, research is going uh, in directions. It's, sea grasses are a kind of uh, uh, and genetics are very important in the whole picture, but it goes from biodiversity to experimental work, so a whole range of uh, different things. So, Ster, may I invite you to uh, give a, a nice overview of your work. I don't know actually what we can exactly present, uh, uh, expect, yeah, maybe it's uh, uh, totally something different. Yeah. Uh, but you will, I think, from a presentation point of view, technical assistance, please. Can it be done from the... Yeah, okay. Thank you for this very nice introduction. No. 
While I'm connecting here, I can say that uh, I had the honor of, to, uh, of being in the first meeting that uh, started to plan this, inter this European, uh, initially European, that became international program, a master program during the MARBEF Network of Excellence. MARBEF means Marine Biodiversity and Ecosystem Function. <laughs> there was, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or more. Um, and uh, Magda Vinks from the University of Ghent had this brilliant idea to start a European level master program and organize a meeting in Ghent. So I was lucky to be in this first meeting where people from different universities came to, to discuss their, and then the first core of, of, the, of the program was defined and the first, and everything started from there. So I wanted to just remember Mike the Vinks here. Olha, pode ser, Catarina. Isto não está a ler. Depois não sai do frame. Se calhar é. Depois ele também sai. É a apresentação? Tem isto. Não, não tem. Tem, tem, tem. Tem. Se calhar era do. Era do coiso. Se calhar era do coiso. Vamos fazer melhor a transmissão por aqui. Conseguimos cá de. E é que puto signo. Qualquer coisa aqui devíamos ter testado antes. Não, não ah, já deu, já deu. Já deu. Não. Boa, obrigada. Posso pôr em cima deste? This is not supposed to be like that. I don't see that in my computer. <laughs> it's presenting something else. No more questions? That's not my desktop. <laughs> Mirror, 
settings. Minimize la ea și trebuie să te cădea ta la părtraș. Deci minimizezi. System settings, exactamente. El deve ta la părtraș, așa. Părtraș de ăștia. Aqui tu vai ser agora fechou. Outra vez. Agora é que é. Não é nada disto. Está a aparecer ali, não está a aparecer no ecrã. Porque está estendido, só, só se arrastar este para lá. Mas depois yeah. fica sem ver. Yeah. Tem que. Tem que... Fecha lá, yeah, fecha yeah. lá e volta a abrir tudo. You have to, to shift it, because it's an extended ah, screen. Está aqui, está aqui. Está ali. Tem que pôr ali a. Mas como é que eu chego com o meu cursor ali? Como é que eu chego com o cursor ali? Está lá em cima. Agora eu vi, deixa para o cursor. Tem um contador. Tem um, não tem um, um laser. E agora, o que é que diz agora? Aqui é mil volts. Tem um laser. Laser não. Não tem um laser. Time? How much do you want? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Having told me about one hour. Well, no, 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 less, less, less. less? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 30, 30 to 40 minutes, if possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you ready? The floor is yours. Hello, again. So I'm sorry for this uh, waste of time. <laughs> And uh, now I have even less time, so I had slides for one hour, and now I only have half an hour. I'm going to try to skip, uh, jump over some, but my objective here was to mainly show lots of examples of master theses, uh, because this is a celebration of uh, master programs and master students. So I thought I'll just uh, put a, uh, here a list of uh, examples from many interesting studies that uh, your previous colleagues have developed over time. And um, some of you have been my students, so you already heard some of these uh, examples. So I'm sorry if this is going to be repeated, but for many of the other ones, I think everything will be new. And uh, I'm going to talk mostly about... Hmm? Where are the images? <laughs> Sorry. My slides don't display. Hmm? No, no, they're not being displayed. I'm just going to move to the other computer. I'm sorry, there's some kind of incompatibility. Vou pôr no outro computador. Tive a sugestão de salvar com o PDF. Está aqui. Ah. Porque como, acho que lá talvez esteja muito pesado para o sistema carregá-los. Minha colega disse que a partir dos 166 já está mostrando algo. Então ela fez a sugestão de salvar o PDF que, que deve funcionar. Ai, desculpe por, por esses problemas, nós estaremos tudo bem. Estão todos animados. E não se scroll all the way down? Like them They says... say it's. Um... Something about the size, this doesn't support the size. What is the first thing you 
your picture? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm just restarting everything.
As luzes?
sit down. Yes, welcome back. Shh. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Uh, things are now set up. I asked Ster to, uh, to try to be concise. It's strange to ask like that. Uh, but of course, we have still another program also to follow up. So uh, until around 4 o'clock. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, uh, we will now listen to master theses from IMBRC, EMBC, and how this can have a, an impact on what we do. Uh, Thank you. Sorry for, for all this. So the problem just solved itself by turning off and on the computer. <laughs> Very technical. Um, Okay, so as I was starting to, to say, I'm going to talk about marine forests. And marine forests are ecosystems that are structural for marine organisms. I hope this is passing the slides. Um, as examples of many, maybe I have to be closer here. As examples of uh, uh, several of the master theses that have been done by many of the students here. Uh, marine forests can be composed of uh, um, seaweeds, kelp forests and other seaweeds, but also sea grasses, we call them marine forests also. We also call marine animal forests, sponge forests, coral forests. So any, here we're talking about ecosystems that are structural. Uh, and um, I'm not tracking the time, so Tim, just tell me when it's four o'clock and I'll stop talking. <laughs> Okay, and the problem uh, that uh, we are addressing in, in, in many of these studies is uh, that biodiversity below species level, the biodiversity that is not vi easily visible in the phenotypes because it's always the same species and we're talking about differences in populations and uh, why do they matter, uh, how different are they, etc. And in many cases, so this is a, a type of biodiversity that you need uh, for, uh, for genetic studies and, and other uh, types of studies, ecological, ecophysiological, to, to really understand the differences and uh, it is important for you as uh, uh, specialists in this area uh, to, to inform the society, uh, politicians and managers in particular, about, uh, about the importance of this level of biodiversity. Uh, for example, you might uh, remember, uh, you don't remember because you're very young, uh, there was a time <laughs> There were, when, when the giant uh, sequoias from California were, were being protected as, as protected areas, um, there was a plan to, def to develop several conservation regions along the coast of the United States for giant sequoias. And the, the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, said a famous phrase, why do you need so many protected areas? It's always the same, tr the same species, it's always the same tree. Why do you need to protect them here and there and there and there in so many places, okay? So this is the, a gen an example of this general concept that uh, we think of conservation at the species level. And if the species is not threatened, why do you need to protect the species in many different places? It's always the same thing, okay? So uh, by studying the diversity below species level, trying to, to, to think about this, and demonstrate that this is not always the case. Here's a photograph of, it's not giant sequoias, but it's a marine forest that um, I used to like very much. Uh, it's, it's extinct these days, and we know that it existed because someone in 1987 took a photograph, <laughs> and that's the only, the only proof that this existed. It was destroyed by the local construction that affected the coastline um, stability and so on. Okay, so does it matter? The species not extinct. The species is very abundant in the north. In the north, northern European waters, it's actually expanding as climate is changing. And uh, the southern populations might be a little bit uh, threatened, but it's expanding elsewhere. So this is the problem that uh, we're trying to, in this talk, I'm trying to, to call your attention to. And uh, for example, one of the obvious uh, implications of this type of problem is for conservation and restoration. If the population goes extinct, in, as, as it did in, at the moment, it doesn't exist. If we think about 
replanting it, let's recover these marine forests that existed in the past. Uh, so then where, who, where should we get these kelp, these kelp species to replant? Who, which one should be the source population? And if we wanted to protect it and to preserve that gene pool before it went uh, before it got destroyed, because we knew already it was going to be destroyed by some uh, harbor construction in this case, um, could we, what should we have done in terms of conservation of this gene pool, etc.? So it is important to understand this, because you, you don't see this biodiversity below species level in the phenotypes, right? So you need to understand this by studying the genotypes. I also want to highlight the importance of photographs. Uh, these days, I don't know, all of you are probably well aware of iNaturalist and citizen science uh, uh, initiatives like that. It's very important that people, citizens like this one uh, that took this photograph, uh, actually report the existence of biodiversity as it's done more and more widely along, along the planet. There's so man, much information that we have presently about what the past used to be just because people were taking photographs and recording what existed and so on. So it's, all, it's a very good example for that. <coughs> and now uh, uh, I'm going to show you some data, some information that's been produced by your colleagues, by master students, and some PhD students too, and some were master students that became PhD students afterwards, as, as uh, Tim highlighted. And, um, uh, and, and this is showing in many cases that when we try to understand what, is, what has caused, what are the main factors that, that set, that determine the present patterns of biodiversity below species level, we often have to understand what was the past scenery, what was the past climate, what were the past oceanographic conditions, because this is a long-term process, the accumulation of genetic diversity is a long-term process, and it often reflects what happened in the past, not just the conditions of today. Okay, so you have to understand this. It is, uh, it is something that uh, there are many processes in ecology, there are many processes that take a long time to, 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 uh, to accumulate, to develop, not just uh, evolution and genetic variability, but also, for example, these days people talk a lot about carbon sequestration. Uh, and this is also a long-term process. Uh, organisms die and they, the biomass is accumulated over a long time and it's important that people understand that, uh, for example, marine sediments have carbon that's sequestered over a long time and you cannot just recover it uh, by doing some, some quick actions. Once it, it's much more important to conserve what existed, just like gene pools. If you destroy, you cannot just replant them. The extinction is forever. You have to wait another thousand years or a million years or many millions of years for it to develop. Same thing with accumulation of carbon. Okay, so uh, what happens in terms of um, uh, the effects of uh, range, climate driven range shifts in terms of setting up the biodiversity below species level? Here you see uh, uh, a diagram that explains uh, how higher latitudes uh, in these days are, tend to, be, uh, to have low diversity and, and to be very homogeneous uh, population-wise compared with uh, long-term persistence zones. So ancient populations that exist, existed a long time, for a long time have accumulated uh, mutations and diversity that have been if they have been stable for a long time, they tend to have more, more alleles, more diversity, more differences among themselves than populations that have re been recently colonized. So for example, if you have here a gene pool and is colonizing a new area, a new habitat that becomes available as the conditions are changing, for example with climate, uh, the newly available habitat tends to be dominated by the, f the first organisms that just happen to be in the expansion front, the first ones that were lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And as they expand, then they, their progeny has very high success, very high fitness, they leave a lot of offspring, and the new populations tend to be dominated by the offspring of the first colonizers, which often weren't even the ones that were bad adapted or anything. It could be just a stochastic process of being in the right place at the right time. But then you tend to have this kind of pattern where the ancient long-term persistence zones retain this sort of alleles left behind during the expansion, and just the first ones that were in the expansion tend to uh, occupy uh, all these areas. And in these days, when we look at the world, if we look at our planet, where do you expect this to be? High latitudes or low latitudes? High latitudes because of, because of the recent past, the recent Pleistocene 
climate changes, right, to inter interglacial, glacial, glacial periods. So, um, for example, during the last glacial maximum, we had uh, ice cover in the northern hemisphere came way uh, into much lower latitudes, uh, also in, in both uh, poles, but here it ex really ex ex ended up causing extinctions of marine biodiversity over a wide range of coastlines. You don't have so many coastlines here, okay? So you see all these coastlines were affected and here there was permanent ice. So for example, uh, the coastline of, let's say, Norway, um, the, the biodiversity that exists now wasn't there. It was, it was frozen. You could, you could walk from Norway to the UK over the ice. Okay, so what happened to marine biodiversity got extinct in the north? Well, uh, there were refugia in the south where all the, the populations of all these species persisted, there were rain shifts and as, as the ice receded, then uh, expansions continued as the conditions became suitable and newly, ha newly available habitats become colonized. So w now uh, let's see how uh, this is reflected in, in this diversity below species level that we don't see directly in the phenotype. So, for example, if you do uh, species distribution models for the present distribution of species, for example, this is one kelp species from the one that occurs in Europe with a uh, more warm tolerant sort of physiology. The southern kelp, Laminaria crolioca, has a distribution in the Azores, Gibraltar, West Africa, Iberian Peninsula with a northern limit in Cornwall. And so if you look at these conditions where it exists in the present and see where were they in the, in the coldest periods of the recent past. Okay, it would have been extinct over here and it would have been, it would have had suitable habitat further south. And in the warmest period of the recent past, which is the mid-Holocene, okay, then it could have been uh, a little bit extinct over this coast. So what is the long-term persistence zone? What are the regions of the world where the species could have survived and persisted? All the old populations could have persisted over a long time, including the coldest and the warmest periods of the recent past. Okay, that's represented here between these lines. And so these are the areas where you expect to have uh, the higher diversity and the other ones, now you know they have been recently colonized. At least that's what models predict. Okay, and then you, if you look at the distribution of diversity, for example, in the species, you see that there's two major genetic groups. One is the entire co continental coastline of Europe, the entire distribution, including some sea mounts. And the other southern group, which is this one represented in red, includes this upwelling zone in the coast of Morocco, the Gibraltar zone, you see colder areas with some upwelling, and also the very deep populations of the Azores, which occur below 60 meter depths in all the oceanic waters, they are very transparent. Okay, and you see now these numbers here represent unique endemic biodiversity, unique alleles that only exist in those populations and don't exist anywhere else. So, uh, most of them are in this southern group. Uh, and uh, this is most of the gene pool of the species. So even though the distribution of this species is, goes from Cornwall to Morocco, mo it, most of the distribution, in the entire European distribution has a small proportion of the diversity. Most of the gene pool of the species is in these populations. So this is the case for many other species, just to show you an example of these populations. For example, the Azores kelp forest at 80 meters depth. Uh, or the ones in Gibraltar, which are very sparse, low density, but very old. Each, each kelp is a, is a very old one. Okay, so there's a lot of applications of this in conservation, restoration, because if you're thinking, so what should be the, the population that's the donor to restore uh, this population? Which one is appropriate? All this information will be useful. So if you're producing either transplanting kelp directly or producing propagules, producing the from gametes, you, you have to use this information to decide what is the best strategy. Okay, this is, I don't want you to look at the, the details of this. Uh, this is a very small map. I just want to highlight that here in this paper we uh, demonstrate that the same effect can be found for kelp that are more uh, arctic, cold adapted, to kelp that are more warm, temperate. Okay, so the ranges are different and the range shifts are different, the persistent zones are different, but in all of them it can be predicted that for the future, uh, in fact, um, the red here represents areas that are predicted to become extinct in the next 100 years due to climate change. And in, in all of these species, there is always some of that 
high diversity, very rich, unique endemic gene pool uh, that, is going to, that is predicted to become extinct in the next 100 years due to rain shifts. Okay, so this is a little bit of a concern for Europe because the species are not threatened at all. In fact, the, the amount of habitat available for the species is actually increasing. As the Arctic becomes suitable, as the ice recedes, there's much more habitat for kelp forests to expand northwards. But they will be uh, the same gene pool, the same homogeneous, low diversity populations that are already in, the, in this margin. And what is being threatened is not the species, it's the unique genetic diversity that's left which at, at the edges, at the, at the low latitude edges. Okay, so there's many more examples of this. I'm going to skip them because, as you know, I have low time, <laughs> not so much time now, but there's many c cases where we have documented this with different students. For example, uh, here's some populations that we know already are gone extinct, <laughs> this diversity. So here, for this species, which is an intertidal species of brown algae, for example, Morocco, which uh, has the highest diversity, then Iberia, and then the north has very f low diversity, much fewer alleles, and uh, some of the populations have gone extinct since we did this study. So some ex of these extinctions are actually happening be before our eyes. Uh, here's an example with giant kelp. Giant kelp Macrocissus pyrifera is an abundant species of the southern hemisphere and it has uh, the, the genetic hotspot of diversity is in California in this area. Uh, so by genotyping all the populations of the world, here the yellow represents Alaska. So if you look at at least the northern hemisphere, which goes from Alaska all the way to Mexico, this is Baja California, this, is the, this plot represents diversity. You see it increases towards the lower latitudes, and it's very low in Alaska. It just represents the same kind of plot. And here, this is also too much detail for you to, to see. I just want to, uh, to highlight the conclusion, which is also the result of a master's thesis, uh, where um, uh, the, the populations from these areas from north, north center, south center, and the southern limit of, of giant kelp were compared physiologically uh, and uh, in, in certain conditions in the hottest temperatures, uh, which are presented here as red, only the southern ones remained. The other ones didn't survive at 24 degrees. And the genes expressed under these conditions were different. This is just to tell you that it's not just genes and alleles that we don't know necessarily their function, then this is reflected in functional diversities where populations actually can be, for example, more best, better adapted to, to warmer temperatures and to other conditions or to resist pathogens or, or something like that. Okay, so we don't know a lot about the functional differences between populations and this is one of the challenges for the future, for your, for your future studies. We can, we can uh, genotype populations, sequence the genomes, compare them and find differences, but then it's important to understand why do they matter. And this is difficult because we can test why do they matter for temperature, for a disease, for, for all kinds of factors, but we don't know what will be the, the challenges of the future. We might think, well, it doesn't make any difference in terms of the present conditions, but we don't know in the future conditions, in, in, when a new pathogen arrives, uh, what, will, what will be the differences in, in resistance among populations, for example. So, of course, um, diversity is always an insurance, again, to, against future changes that may be negative. Okay, so we have many more examples which I'm going to skip again quickly. This is just to show you, perhaps this is interesting because it's to show you that when you do again this exercise that I was telling you about using species distribution models to understand what are the permanent, long-term permanent populations that have the highest diversity because they have not become extinct during the hot, hottest uh, past and the coldest past. So for example, in this case, for this species, which is intertidal, uh, if you look, take the present distribution in California and see, okay, during the coldest period it would have been here, in the warmest recent period it would have been here. So uh, the, this area, southern, this area in Baja California, in Mexico, uh, would have been extinct during the mid-Holocene, just 6,000 years ago. That's what the models predict. And in fact, when you look at the uh, genetic diversity. This area is different from the previous one in, in California. It actually is the same as in, the, in this island. So it shows that uh, after it became extinct 6,000 years ago, it was not recolonized from the coastline. It was colonized from the populations in the islands. 
Okay, so you can use this information to understand these types of effects, the sources of colonization. This is just one other, one other species, just to, I'm not going to say any more about this, other than that some of these southernmost populations in Mexico, in Baja California, they have not, they have not been found anymore. We went back there and, and we didn't find them. Okay, so another, another effect that uh, can, is interesting is uh, that during these expansions, it's not always just uh, uh, homogenization and loss of diversity. A lot of interesting things can happen during range expansions and they can actually increase by diversity and create species instantaneously. And this becomes much more interesting now. Uh, one of the facts that causes this is uh, when uh, differentiated populations contact and then they uh, recombine their genomes and when they recombine their genomes, they form new genomes that didn't exist before. And these can have different uh, ecophysiological traits, e ecological traits, can even form different species that don't reproduce back with the parental species and instantaneously create new diversity. So actual uh, range expansions can be uh, very rapid evolution pumps that are driving the creation of new diversity. And this is one of the reasons why studying the poles, studying the Arctic and the Antarctic, but especially the Arctic, can be very interesting because you have um, species expanding northwards from many different sides, from the eastern and western coastlines, and even from the Atlantic and the Pacific, and then meeting in the Arctic. It's like a melting pot of, of, of range expansions from many different sources. And some, you know, often you have the same population coming from different coastlines, very differentiated populations of the same species. And then when they actually recombine, uh, they form uh, new diversity. And so this, this is what this... Uh, this diagram is explaining, for example, you have expansions from one side, but you also have expansions of the same species from another side. It could even be a different species, but re sufficiently related that they can still reproduce. And then it forms these hybrids, which are recombinations of genomes. And this is novel evolution, is the creation of novel diversity that didn't exist before due to climate-driven climate, climate -driven changes. Okay, so I'm going to try to go pass this example quickly, just to say, for example, for this species, Fucus serenoides, which is an endemic species of, of Europe, uh, all the mitochondria and chloroplasts of the native species, of the species themselves, only exist in the Iberian Peninsula, throughout the entire distribution in, in Europe, except for the Iberian Peninsula and a little bit in Brittany. Um, the, the, the native organelles have gone, been replaced by organelles from another species. So this is a species with foreign organelles from another species. How does this happen during uh, post-glacial recolonization? As it started to expand in, in Europe, it met the other species with which it could still hybridize, and then the first organisms, the first uh, uh, individuals that were in expansion front ended up expanding with, with the foreign organelles. Um, and when hybrids are formed, but they are not uh, they are reproductively isolated with the, with the original contacting populations, they can develop new species and form speciation. This is an example here from the coast of California again, uh, where you had initially, before our studies, there were two species which were sister species. One was a cold adapted species all over the, the western coast of the United States, and the other one was a southern species that occurred in Mexico and southern California. And after studying this, uh, and looking a little bit better at what happens at the contact zone between these two species, we found two new species. And this is a, maybe a complex uh, story to, to tell in such a short time, but basically there were two hybrid species. Um, one is, has this very narrow range, okay? And it's a hybrid between another one that has this very narrow range and this one. And, and we found also that this one is a hybrid between, so that's this here, between this yellow one that is almost extinct, this is only present in a very, very, very small place, and this one and another one that is already extinct that we don't find anywhere. How do you know this? When you look at the genome, for every single locus, you find always one copy from, from the mother that comes from one genome and the copy from the father that comes from another genome. For everywhere you look in the genome, you always find, always has one copy from this one and another copy from another one. So this is an interesting case where you have one species that has gone extinct, but the genome of the species is not extinct. The genome of this extinct species still exists. It's half of the genome of this species, okay? 
Um, so if you wanted to know what was the genome of this extinct species, well, it's still there. So this species is the one ex that is extinct plus this one. Every locus has the two copies. And uh, they are actually ecologically differentiated. Well, this is a transcriptome, so gene expression study showing that the expression, the gene expression of the recombined genomes is very different from the parental ones. So they have a lot of uh, advantages of being, of having a copy from different differentiated mothers and fathers. And I'm going to go skip over the details. And in terms of ecological fitness, you can also see the same thing. Uh, for example, here is a a test of how they survive an exposure at, at a heat wave. If you ha have a heat wave of 30 degrees, which would be a heat wave in California, um, when you have <coughs> this species, which is this hybrid I was telling you about, uh, it is a combination of this one, which would die after eight hours at 30 degrees, and this one, which would die even after a few hours at 30 degrees. But this one survives all the time is much more resistant to heat waves than both parental species. Okay, so just to show you another example of how climate-driven rain shifts, recombined genomes, create new combinations that have different traits, different fitness, and can be more resistant, for example, to heat waves than both parental species. Um, <coughs> this is another example of such things. I'm going to pass pass it quickly as well, but just a cold, this is laminaria, a cold adapted laminaria and a warm adapted laminaria. If you produce hybrids between the two, the hybrids actually survive temperatures where both parental species could not survive. Okay, for example, the hybrids were still alive at 25 degrees when, where the, the cold adapted and the warmer adapted did not survive those conditions. And they were mostly reflecting the thermal tolerance of the female, of the, of the mother, rather than the father. So it's, there's a lot of interesting things that happen when genomes get recombined. And this combination of genomes is driven by climate. It's one of the things, when we think of climate changes, we just think of loss of diversity, loss of species, extinctions, and bad consequences. But there's a lot of very interesting evolutionary processes that are happening. The Arctic is especially interesting. As I told you, so as, as the ice started to recede, you had populations expanding throughout Europe into the north, from nor uh, North America on both sides, and then the Pacific started to contact through the Bering Strait, started to enter the Arctic Ocean and contact populations from the Atlantic that had been isolated for a long time. And what happens? Then you have a lot of examples of interesting things that happen. Um, so here, if we look just in the Atlantic, for example, for this species, uh, you have, when you look at Greenland and Iceland, you have the, the genomes of these species, which is Fucus viclosus, the brown algal, uh, have a combination in Greenland and Iceland, they're all half from America and half from Europe. This shows that this was an area that was colonized more recently than the other ones, and all the, all the individuals there are a combination of American and European origins. And in fact, there was also, I should just also highlight that they are physiologically different. Uh, in, I'm, no, I'm not going to go through over the details again, but at higher temperatures, when you reach, uh, um, when you have a heat wave again, the ones from, from the south resist better than the ones from, from the north. And so these genetic differences actually are reflected in fitness. Okay, uh, here, uh, is just to show you an, an example for the same species of during a heat wave, during a, a period when there was a, a, a very warm conditions. Uh, one unique lineage in the south, most of the populations were extinct. Um, so these uh, sort of threats from climate actually are happening, uh, but they can sometimes recover. And here's another interesting example. Here in the Algarve, near Albufeira, just very close by, this is a population of brown algae in 2004, and this is the same site, exactly the same photograph in 2010. Again, to show you the importance of finding photographs from the past, because you can combine and compare and see how things change. Uh, this is the uh, albufeira, as I said. So in 2011, the population came back. Some individuals of this species came back when you couldn't see any single individual before. And by using genetic methods, we had samples from, from this species population before, we found that it, it had the exact same alleles that were unique, that didn't exist anywhere else for the species except in Albufeira. 
And when he came back in 2011, it still had the same alleles from Albufeira. So by using this method, you can see that it came back from the same exine population. It didn't come back from external sources. Somehow there were some microscopic stages that we didn't find that survived there. So by using these types of approaches, comparing populations and having the, the genetic difference between populations, you can also track and see uh, when there's, for example, extinctions, uh, what is the process of recovery? Is it from something that stayed there that wasn't visible, or is it from external colonization, external connectivity and dispersal from other populations? We found the same thing, for example, in Mexico, in Baja California, at the southern edge of giant kelp, uh, during an El Nino period when we couldn't see any giant kelp in the area, but afterwards, when it came back, it had the same alleles that were there before. Okay, in the, in, the, in the Arctic Ocean still, so here's a, the same species. Uh, this is Saccharina latissima, it's a sugar kelp, it's a species that's edible, um, it's cultivated in Europe, and this is how it looks in Alaska, in the Pacific. And this is how it looks in uh, Greenland, in the Atlantic. And this is how it looks in the Arabian Peninsula, in Spain, where it's much smaller, so it's always the same species, but the populations are very different, genetically different, physiologically different, and you see morphologically different. Um, and, but it's, so it's all the same species. And when we compare genetically the population from all over the distribution of these species, um, this was also a master's thesis, and so then um, you, what we found was this very interesting pr aspect that here in western Greenland and in Hudson Bay, you find a mixture of individuals from Canada, from the Atlantic Canada, with individuals from the Pacific. So this showed that there were genotypes that were endemic of the Pacific that have already entered the Arctic Ocean through the Bering Strait and have reached this area. And now they are meeting the same species, but coming from the Atlantic. And this is probably happening to a lot of individuals, a lot of species. Uh, the same type of process will happen more and more as the Arctic uh, ice recedes and more and more colonization into the Arctic is happening. Uh, what happens then? Then the, the big question is what? When they meet, will they reproduce and homogenize and, and become all mixed up? Or will they be, are they somewhat reproductively isolated and will this uh, reproductive isolation uh, re remain? So then they will actually be a different species already. Um, by looking at this contact zone, what we find is there are some recombined genomes where they have half of one, spe half of one ocean, half of the genome from the Atlantic and half of the genome from the Pacific. But in fact, most of them are only exclusively Pacific and exclusively Atlantic. This suggests that there is not total reproductive isolation, but there's already some, some incipient isolation, at least most of them. You still see, oh, this is a Pacific one, this is an Atlantic one, and it's always the same species. This is another example that's fantastic. This is in Alaska. Alaska is the total melting pot of things. So Alaska, as you can expect, it was, was um, uh, full of, uh, covered by ice during the last glacial maximum. This is a species of Fucus, which is an intertidal, uh, an intertidal alga that probably most of you know. And this species is abundant all over the coast of the United States, the Pacific coast of the United States, from California to Alaska. Uh, passing through Canada and so on, and then it continues in Japan and so on. And along this coastline, there's many different genetically unique groups that are exclusively distributed in very small stretches of coastline. Um, and uh, in fact, one interesting aspect here is that in San Francisco Bay, you have the same uh, genotype that's present north, northwards, and we'll talk about that uh, another time. Uh, anyway, uh, so what I wanted to highlight here is that when you reach, so this here is this, okay? And then you go further north into Alaska and you see a lot of colors. What is these colors? It's a mixture of, of, of fucus that come from America with a mixture of the ones that come from, from uh, Russia and Japan, okay? So they're meeting in Alaska. What, the, what is interesting is that when they meet, they are uh, vertically segregated. So in most of the cases, you have like a high focus and a low focus. It's always the same species, but you see in this photograph, for example, I think I have a better photograph, I'll show you. Usually there's like one, s one layer over there, which is the high one, very different in, in physiology, physiology distribution, etc., from the lower shore one. And when you genotype, you see that, for example, in this case, the lower shore comes from certain populations and the high shore comes from other populations. 
uh, like here, for example. Uh, the low shore comes from Oregon, and the high shore comes mostly from Russia. So it's the same species coming from different sources, and when they meet, they actually are physiologically different, such that some, one of the populations is more tolerant to, to the intertidal stresses, and uh, they're not actually mixing. They're staying mostly uh, segregated in this, in this aspect. And this is, was a master thesis of, of a student uh, that uh, genotype populations throughout the, the Aleutian Islands, this is Alaska, into Canada, uh, until Vancouver, and you see there's often like a segregation of high and low shore in the intertidal, which is a very small area, right, small range. You have often a, the same species of fucus has a high shore and a low shore population. They are different and the, the sources are different. So some of these are coming from one side of the Pacific, from the other side, and depending on the places where you look, you find different combinations. You find different sources, some are coming from Oregon, some are coming from Washington, some are coming from Japan, some are coming from Russia. And here you have this total melting pot in Alaska. So Alaska is really fascinating. So this is what we find when you look at fukus. If you go and look at snails or uh, limpets or any other populations, you probably find the same thing, really lots of interesting things to find if you, if you start doing master's thesis about, about what's happening in the Arctic. And the Southern Ocean is quite different. The Southern Ocean, as you can see, is not, a, is not an ocean, right? It has Antarctica, it's a continent there, and the ocean, the Southern Ocean is, is uh, connected. It didn't become separated, split in by the, by during the glacial periods. It didn't become uh, two isolated water masses. Um, there has always been a lot of connectivity, even when the ice got close to Patagonia. Um, and since then, there's very, very strong connectivity by the Southern Ocean currents, the west wind drift. Uh, so lots of different hypotheses can be raised for the Southern Ocean, for the Antarctic zone versus the Arctic. Um, and here's for giant kelp again. When you look at the diversity, remember we were looking at the diversity in the Northern Hemisphere before, and now when we look at the Southern Hemisphere, so here's uh, Chile, the coast of Chile, Patagonia, um, and here's um, uh, the Falkland Islands, for example. This is the ice cover during uh, the last glacial maximum and before and, and currently. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that with more detail because there was the thesis of one master student from the Imbra Sea comparing Patagonia and the Falkland Islands. Now uh, I'm going to first show here uh, just an example, examples from South Africa. Anyone here from South Africa? Yeah. <laughs> South Africa is a fascinating coast, of course, because it has all these different uh, uh, oceanographic conditions on one side and the other. This is a kelp from, from South Africa, Liminaria pallida, also occurs in uh, Namibia. Uh, it goes all the way to the coast, to the southern edge of Angola. And so along the coast from Namibia to, to Cape Town, more or less, you find three major, well, two major genetic groups. One is exclusively endemic to Namibia, and the other one is uh, in southern Namibia and all over South Africa, but most of the gene pool is actually in the south, in the area of, of Cape Town. In this, the Cape region has a lot more alleles, a lot more diversity than the, nor than the northern region. This is the opposite of what you'd expect, taking into account what we just saw for the northern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, we saw uh, high diversity in low latitudes, and as they expand northwards into the poles, there's low diversity. Here, uh, the difference is that uh, this area has not been, uh, uh, it's not, uh, models show that it was not extinct during the last glacial maximum. It was not that cold or covered by ice, so that the higher latitude populations are actually stable, long-term persistent populations. So the gradient of latitude at, in, in this coast of uh, Africa does not show the same uh, effect because it, doesn't, it didn't get so into such high latitudes that was affected by this last glacial maximum in this case. Uh, here for other kelp from South Africa, Eclonia. There's two, sp two major species, Eclonia maxima, which is from the cold coastline of South Africa and, and Namibia, and Eclonia radiata, which is a species present in the warmer coastline of South Africa, all the way to Mozambique, and then Australia. Um, and so this is the uh, Indian Ocean species, much warm, more, more warm affinities. Um, Okay, so genetic information also showed very interesting uh, aspects. 
Um, and so the student that studied this found, for example, that in the contact zone between the cold species and the warm species, you find uh, individuals that have the nuclear genome of the cold Eclonia species and the mitochondrial genome of the warm Eclonia species. Again, it shows that in, when the two, so the warm and the cold species, which are different species, but in, in the contact range, there must have been some hybridization event that made one species take over this, the, the, the organelle of the other one. Uh, and there's uh, a lot more uh, diversity in between that I could explain, but uh, there's no time, so I'll just advance. Um, this is the thesis of another Imbrisi student that was comparing populations of um, uh, the Falklands and, and, um, and the Patagonia. And here, so two kelp, spe two kelp species were compared. And so here you see uh, the Antarctic continent, and you see <coughs> here Patagonia, and the Falcons are located here. So here, uh, this area was covered by ice during the last glacial maximum, but giant kelp could have survived, and the kelp species could have survived here on the Argentinian coastline during that period. And this is a hypothesis that, that was being tested. We didn't know if it was, if they had survived or not. We know here in the coast of Chile, it was all packed ice, so there couldn't have been any kelp forests, for sure. The, the habitat was not suitable. But the main, que the question that remains was, did the, did the marine forests of, of Patagonia survive in Argentina? Uh, and, and in the Falkland Islands, for sure, they could have survived because they were not covered by ice during this period, and they are quite, cold tolerant species. So for example, for, um, for Macrocystis purifera, the giant kelp, um, the, there was the, so I'm showing only the, the data based on um, microsatellites, and then there was phylogenetic data based, phylogenomic based on genome comparisons of transcriptomes. Anyway, so there were three major genetic groups found. One was from uh, Patagonia, the other one was mostly present only in Falkland Islands, and then the other one was in South Africa. So we wanted to know in the Atlantic giant kelp, what were the major groups that existed? So we found, okay, South Africa has a group of giant kelp that's different from, from the dominant one in the Falklands and from the one in, in Patagonia. This suggests, well, in Falkland Islands, then you find the three, but that suggests that they, because one is dominant and the other ones are just present in, in a few edge populations, like this one from Patagonia is just present, we just found it here, and this one from South Africa, we just found it here on the west coast, so that suggests that they have already been receiving colonizers, recent colonizers from, from these both sides of the Atlantic. But it also suggests that uh, Patagonia didn't go completely extinct, that some populations had time to differentiate there and to diverge, and probably this might be, uh, this supports a hypothesis of refugial zone uh, on the eastern coast of, of southern South America, so the Argentinian coast. Same thing for Lasonia species. Lasonia species is another kelp from, from this area that your colleague from the Imbrisi also used for her thesis, and uh, uh, when she was studying this, she found that uh, they were actually new species that were not known. Uh, so it, it's, it's the same story that shows that indeed Argentina could have had the refugial zones where kelp didn't go completely extinct in Patagonia. They could have survived there in areas that maybe are not suitable these days. Uh, but uh, in addition, in, in each site, there were always two different groups, one, for the more sh one shallower and the deeper one. So this suggests that um, uh, the there's been differentiation, speciation in each coast, speciation between a northern and a, a shallow and a deeper group all over Patagonia. And then in the Falklands, there were several different genetic groups, which were different from them as mainly in Australia, which were then have different species. This is not genetic groups within one species. Here we're talking about different species. The differentiation when uh, your colleague from the embassy actually used, um, uh, is Laura Preek, she used, uh, transcriptomes to do phylogenomics and, um, and found that the, the level of differentiation between these groups was, was clearly showing that there were different species. Okay, I think, is this, am I running out of time, Tim? Is it? 
Uh, okay, I just uh, very quickly go <laughs> over what I was going to say. I was going to talk about Africa, just to show you examples of what students were doing in Africa. Uh, DNA barcoding and environmental DNA is something we're using a lot. And here's an example of studies uh, looking for elasmobranch uh, diversity, trying to identify, for example, here we go and sample uh, DNA from these salting wells. For example, in Mauritania, in these areas where uh, guitar fish and sharks and, and, and rays are being sold, many actually cite these species, uh, um, heads, etc. Uh, by doing a catalog of their DNA barcodes, we can find what species are being traded even when we don't have the species. Just by sampling the sand or the water inside the salting wells, we found what DNA is there and we can see that these species have been there even when we don't have the individuals. So it's very interesting applications. Uh, using eDNA barcoding, also here in Africa for Guinea-Bissau, for example, we have identified what are the prey of green turtles. Green turtles are herbivorous, they eat seaweeds and seagrass, and we can identify by in the esophagus. This was also a Mimbrasi student, um, um, and, and she um, uh, did this uh, study and published this paper immediately, uh, I think even before she defended her thesis, Lucia Diaz Abad, last year, and did this very interesting uh, discovery of the, 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 what, were the what was the composition of the diets of green turtles, which have this site in Guinea-Bissau is the largest nesting a uh, site for green turtles in the eastern Atlantic. Okay, now we know why they go there and what they're eating. Um, this is another master's thesis uh, where like all the species of uh, uh, sharks and rays of, of uh, Mauritania were identified, cataloged, and using this catalog, just by taking water samples, she could identify what species were present in areas where we had no samples of fish, we just had samples of the water, and you could see that in all these places, which are in a marine protected area in Mauritania, in the Bank Darga, uh, she could find all these different species in their relative abundances, a lot of different species of elasmobranchs, just using eDNA. Uh, we could also identify the bacteria, that the bacteria by the biodiversity in different habitats. Um, we could predict, uh, another student predicted the, the effects of climate ch uh, change on the habitats, on the seagrasses themselves. Okay, restoration. This is a student, has Lisa, for example, another th student uh, of the Imbrasip, studied what was the relative contribution of sexual reproduction and versus clonal propagation for seagrasses in Mauritania, in the Bank Darga. Okay, connectivity mediated by green turtles. And so I just go finish and I just wanted to show, I was trying to to have a, a list of all the names of the students, but I didn't finish because I was just writing here and then someone told me that my talk was a little bit earlier. So here's some of the names, but there's many more names I didn't have time to add and the photographs I also didn't have time to add. Okay, thank you for your attention. So if you want to appear in a few years in a talk of Ashton, you know uh, <laughs> who you need as a promoter. It's time for one or two small questions, and maybe in the meantime, the people from the Siena group can already set up their materials because they are uh, strict in timing. Yeah, uh, so one or two small questions, who dares? Nobody dares. Ah, okay, yes. That's a very interesting question. Uh, in this in this study, no, uh, because it was in a, in a sort of a warmer range in California. But that's a very important question because it could have been that they are less tolerant or or even more tolerant. So that is that should uh, would be the complete story of the of the of the study, especially because this is a parental species that's cold tolerant and a parental species that's warm tolerant. So when the two are recombining, uh, here you see, well, in the habitat where they are, because they live higher on the shore, the hybrids live higher on the shore and the more heat stress, uh, then you see that they are more uh, 
stress resistant to heat waves, but they could also be more resistant to co cold waves because uh, the, they are more time, also during the winter, exposed to air that's colder than the seawater. So that is a very good question, and it's something that is available for your master's thesis. If anyone wants to study this for, your, for the next year, you can just go to California, a beautiful place in Monterey Bay, and study this question. That's a very good idea for a thesis. Move to the real practicalities. There is also a, a second, call it keynote, where it's uh, uh, actually a group of people that works on uh, documentaries, if I'm correct. And one of the nice things, again, is that it's one of the students of the first group, Nicolas Blanc, is also involved. Yeah, so on the ones that you saw on the picture, he is not here unless he just pops up somewhere, but he's not here. Uh, somebody has to leave here and from this group in very short time, so I will leave the floor to this uh, group of young people that will explain what they have do been doing and what they will do.
Uh, does anyone have a question about deep sea mining, the issues surrounding deep sea mining? Or do you want us to start a bit? Yeah. Uh, there's already. Okay. Wait, Wait. there's a microphone going on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about deep sea mining, a little bit of background so that we have a little bit of a reference to go off of? Okay, so I start then. Uh, so I think, I think Yolene wanted this to be a bit different, but because of the schedule change, uh, it's, it has to be firstly the debate, and because the idea was that you would see a 20 minute video to get the introduction going on before the debate. Uh, so uh, deep sea mining, uh, what it is, basically we will have some machines uh, on the seafloor trying to harvest the minerals that are of interest for, uh, for many things, to do many things, such like your computers, your mobile phones, they are loaded with metals. So the metals are necessary for the world economy. And nowadays, um, uh, the Western countries are more worried about the supply of minerals because many of them, most of them come from China or uh, they're, uh, under develop, developing countries, and there's always this issue, afraid, they are afraid of the issue of the supply that Europe and uh, the US don't have control on the future supply of metals. So uh, there was this interest in, in uh, going to the deep sea to collect these metals. This comes back from the 60s, eventually. And eventually it was also the trigger for the United Nations Law of the Sea uh, to, to develop these uh, this regulations. With the idea to, to have this Law of the Sea was to protect also the deep sea environment from environmental harm. In practical, uh, nowadays there are several companies developing this, uh, these collectors, these machineries, these boats, to, to go out, to, to harvest the minerals, to, to, to process the minerals, to take them on board and take them to, to land. Uh, you have three, uh, three types of deposits. So you have the polymetallic nodules that you have in the Pacific, uh, for example, in an area known because it's a huge area with uh, different concessions from different countries and companies that is clearing Clipperton's fracture zone. It's between Hawaii and uh, the US coast. Um, and so, and you also have other types of minerals that you have cobalt crusts, that they are, it's the, the rocks covering uh, seamounts. And you have the, polymetallic sulfide deposits that are uh, originated with uh, hydrothermalism. And you have this uh, usually near um, the, mid uh, the Atlantic, uh, the ocean ridges, like in the mid-Atlantic ridge, you have these uh, hydrothermal vents. There's more interest to harvest uh, the inactive areas and not the active areas. Uh, from the point of view of research, we are studying, uh, trying to understand what might be the environmental impact from this, uh, from this activity, and it's not easy. I don't know if you can help us. I don't know if that was clear. Do you have any further questions following what Nelia said? No. I can elaborate a bit maybe on the policy side. Uh, I work for Siena. Um, as Yolene said, I am primarily a fisheries a policy officer, but now I'm turning a bit more into climate policy officer. As you all know, I'm sure you all know that climate and ocean are you know, absolutely connected. That's why in Siena we decided to shift a bit to a different approach and um, uh, start to intervene a, a bit more in this extractivism and these activities. We had, um, we had a, a role to play in what happened in Algarve. Maybe you don't know because, 
because uh, I think that you are only here for this year, but several years ago, not several years ago, like five years ago or something, uh, we had um, uh, this oil company that was interested in exploiting uh, oil in the Algarve, in Al Jazeera. Most of you were there probably already. And we were involved in this, in this interaction between ocean and climate and how ocean could be really a great uh, ally in fighting climate change and its effects. So that was basically when we entered this climate uh, movement because until then we were basically just focusing on ocean activities and focusing on what was happening only in the ocean like MPAs, litter, fisheries of course, aquaculture. But since then we decided that yeah we could not continue to ignore the connection between ocean and climate and that's why we are super involved also in deep sea mining. So we have some big news actually, you know that the UN Oceans Conference uh, um, ended last Friday, yeah, last Friday in Lisbon, we were present there and there were some developments regarding deep sea mining. I would say, I don't know Nelly if you agree, that deep sea mining was the hot topic of this, of this UN Oceans Conference and if you go on online and see the news you'll probably also agree with me. Um, it was basically a place for us, the NGOs and other civil society movements to say to our civil servants, our politicians, yeah, that's not something we want to do in the next 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years. We don't know enough. We are not scientists like Nelia and the, the people from her group, but we do know how to read science. We do know what the science is telling us. And we really do believe that the moratorium is what should be in place. And that's what we are working on for the past 10 years, maybe. So we are together with several other NGOs from all around Europe, all around the world, especially the, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. If you don't know them, you should. They're really good. They are working to defend the deep sea from mining, but not only that. And we partnered with them to basically put up a global campaign asking for our politicians to implement, seriously implement um, deep sea mining moratorium. So that work has been developed, we have been doing that and during, the, during this conference we had, we supported and we helped to launch an alliance of countries against deep sea mining. You probably also heard about that in the news. So this alliance was launched by three Pacific um, islands, yeah all of them Pacific I think. Uh, so it was uh, launched by Palau, Samoa, and Fiji, and Fiji, all of these three countries, basically their governments basically decided to position themselves and say, yeah, we don't want to do that because those places are of interest of these Western, mostly European companies. So they, they did say this, they put up this alliance and they basically during the UN Oceans Conference said this and asked for a room, uh, in, in front of a room like this, who else is with us? Who else wants to join this alliance? This is not a spoiler for you, but no one really uh, joined them yet. But, so that was a bit disappointing, disappointing to be honest, but we know that several other countries, some European, some not, are uh, starting to position themselves as also as yes, in favor of a moratorium. It's important to say that, that this moratorium won't forbid or won't ban uh, scientific uh, expeditions or scientific research, obviously, because we do need to know what's down there. You know, uh, We don't know most of the things that are happening down there and we still want to know what's happening because truly it's such a value um, and it's such a precious ecosystem that we should definitely know what we are protecting. But what we are asking and what these countries are also asking is for a true precautionary approach. That's what we need. We need to solve, we need to solve several other issues in land before we go there. Because once we go there, there's no way back. And that's what we are working currently. There was also another development during the conference which was President Macron saying that he would be in favor of supporting a moratorium but on high seas. And that's something that left us like, okay, this is good, but 
please let's do this, because it's not only words, we don't need only words. And that's, that was essentially our message throughout the UN Oceans Conference. It's great that we have intentions, it's great that you are saying all the things we need to hear, it's great that you are committing yourselves with the 30% uh, of ocean protected, absolutely fantastic, but please let's do this. And that's the next step probably, that's what, where we are going. Don't get me wrong, we are happy that President Macron said this, even though it's only on high seas, and we could challenge the idea of saying, okay, let's start by national waters. Why don't you start by saying that France does not allow um, deep sea mining in their waters? Why, do, why don't you start by saying that? It didn't. But let's see how this unfolds. The other thing that I can tell you, and since, since we are in Portugal, uh, I think it's worth for you to know, we launched a petition on Friday asking for our prime minister. This is, a, this is a subject that is going to be dealt on the prime minister level. It's not something that's going to be dealt in the Ministry of Environment or the Sea or Economy or whatever. This is prime minister business. So we launched a petition, which I invite you all to uh, go there and to sign it, basically asking for our prime minister to implement a moratorium on Portuguese water, saying, yeah, deep sea mining is not happening here anytime soon. But this is only a moratorium. Remember that it's not a full ban, it's a moratorium. I think that's the reasonable thing to ask right now. So we ask them two things. Please do implement a moratorium and position yourself in the ISA, which is the International Seabed Authority, this authority that manages the deep sea outside of the national uh, seas. Please position Portugal as in favor for a global moratorium. This petition is running. We have close to 1,000. I think 900, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, signatures. Please do sign it. It's very easy to find. Just Google petition, deep sea mining, Portugal. You'll find it right away. Or on WWF's uh, Facebook, for instance. I know they have uh, uh, posted something on Facebook. So please do sign that moratorium and do spread it all across your contacts and colleagues that are interested or worried about this. We really need to do something. I will shut up. Right now, uh, we still, uh, I have something that, that may interest you, which is why this is so urgent right now. We have a deadline running. I will uh, talk about that maybe a bit later. I hope this was helpful to contextualize the problem. Do any of you have other questions or more specific questions? Yes, uh, hello. Uh, my question concerning uh, another side of uh, this issue. What are the alternatives for uh, the consumers? Like uh, if we, you, you spoke about uh, the need for these uh, materials for uh, technological uh, advancement and uh, improvements. And uh, how can we um, have uh, this technology without going into deep sea mining and what are the alternatives for uh, this, uh, uh, this issue? I don't know if you, if you cover also this side of the problem. Uh, do you want me to, to reply now or do you want to collect more, more questions before? Uh, I don't know. Yes, we might take two questions, two or three questions and then we'll answer everything. Okay. I don't know, maybe it's harder to reply actually. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. My question was kind of building off of that, like, is there a push to, like, move away from the need for these materials or metals, and, like, the mining on land can't be much better than deep sea mining, so, like, what things are being done to try to move away from okay. using these? I think we can try to reply to these two because they are going, they are in line. Uh, I think the issue is, like, so I belong to this uh, Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, that is one thing that puts all the, almost all the deep sea research community, most ecologists or biologists, uh, we are all associated with this. This is very good for us to contribute to, to regulations from the International Seabed Authority when there is anything like that. And we are also, it's, it's nearly two years, we, we are having these uh, virtual meetings to try to, to, to reach to a paper that can be published 
trying to, to deal with this dichotomy. Is it better land-based? Is it better deep-sea mining? And it's really hard to compare. But basically, uh, there is no justification to say that there's no enough resources on land to justify going to the deep sea. Probably the idea of going to deep sea mining, it's because the technology is now almost able to do it. And might be only the thing like we go because we can, not because they need, not because it's profitable, so it's, it's dodgy why they really want to go deep sea mining. Uh, and the, the, the metals, you, there's this idea the circular, circular economy could be an option, but maybe not all the countries are ready to do it. So, I don't know, do you want to add something? Yeah, so uh, we won't be here for sure pretending that we have the solution uh, for uh, the consumption patterns that, that we have and that we now know that are unsustainable. We have to uh, make a shift, and this is the hard truth, we have to make a shift from this linear economy to a more cir circular, circular one. Um, I think and we think that this moratorium is justified by the fact that we haven't done enough in land, and I'm not talking about mining a bit more in land because land is, as you know, quite damaged already. But we need to work on redesign, recycle, we need to work on new technologies that don't need this kind of materials and or need, need them less. And we all know that when we have to, technology develops super, super fast. And that's what we are saying, please let's invest and let's put public money into research that help us to not need these materials. That's what we think that we should do. Again, we don't have a magical solution, but there aren't for this problem, to be honest, there aren't any. We just need to focus on a bit more research and try to change the way we use materials and minerals in land. We already have a lot of things in our um, uh, landfills, we have already a lot of materials inside our drawers in our houses from all the cell phones that we kept on using and didn't do anything about them. So let's try and let's push for new legislation. Let's, let's try to change this legislation about programmed obsolescence. Is that a name in English? Absolence, I don't know how to say. You know, when you buy something new and it's programmed to be obsolence, that's the name. You know what I'm saying, right? I don't know how to say this in English, okay. So, I know to, I'll say this in Portuguese, but probably you won't get it. But, uh, but uh, let's try to change this legislation because it's mad that we keep on buying new phones that in, within two years are not working. It's mad that we can't really fix them themselves, uh, ourselves. It's mad that we can't hold these companies accountable. I mean, you are paying 600, 700 uh, euros for a phone that's not working within two or three years. That's mad. And that's, that needs legislation. We need to stop this madness because we need to be able to fix these things. We need to have repair cafes. We need to do a lot of things inland before starting to damage the deep sea because we are only going to continue this old logics of the earth is here for us to have things. We can take everything from the land or from sea and everything should be okay. And there's even a bigger problem because, I mean, we all know that in land things are not monetized as they should, but imagine on the deep sea. Imagine what's going to happen down there and we have no idea. Nobody's going to, uh, to control it. It's impossible. Imagine what's going to happen there. Nobody lives there. They don't have people to, to say that they, want, that they don't want a mine there. So please, let's do something inland. Let's try to change things here while where we can see them, where we can hear it, before going there. Uh, a lot of NGOs are pushing for a global ban on deep sea mining. Maybe that's the future. Maybe that's what, where we're going. But right now, we are just asking for a moratorium. We desperately need more time to do more research. And that's what we are asking.
Okay, so there has been a little change. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, unfortunately, the movie, we're not going to show it now, um, but during the professional practi uh, practice exhibition from today, you can come to my stand and you will be able to see it. So it's kind of a teaser to come and see the movie at my stand. Um, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you very much, Nelia, to have come and, and talked about the issue. I hope it sparked an interest in some of you um, to learn a bit more about this issue. And um, also for, well, the first years, I will send the link for the petition so you can all sign. And second years, I will send it to someone and send it on the WhatsApp group. And there you go. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry that I had to stop you, yeah, but uh, I'm sure during the professional practice exhibitions, this is a talk, a discussion that will go on. And I can immediately ask who has bought a new phone in the last two months? Ah, yeah, okay, these are the people that we have to chat to probably, yeah? Anyway, um, I just wanted to make sure that we stay in line with the original schedule because in about, uh, uh, let's hear, in 20 minutes, yeah, the first group of professional practice exhibitioners have to start to set up their things uh, and we want to make sure they have time to set their things up. So hereby, the practical announcements, that's the idea now. First of all, communication. I think you're being taking pictures already. Uh, you're sharing things. Uh, it's quite important that you're proud on the fact that you're a member of this program. You receive these uh, fabulous pens. Yeah, uh, Olivier calls them IMBRC pens or something. IMBR pens. Yeah, so something like that. You have to talk to uh, Olivier to know what they are. Um, make sure you always use the correct hashtags if you post things on uh, TikTok or Instagram or LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. Yeah, so diving into marine mines and IMBRC at least, at least. Other things are also possible. Um, Another important thing is we have developed, uh, I attempt Kent was mainly involved in this, a conference app, a symposium app. Uh, you can scan this QR code and then you will end up on something which looks like that. The idea of this app is that you know always what is happening and where you should be. Yeah. Uh, so which rooms, etc., etc. So this combined with the WhatsApp group that you're all in, uh, should make sure that you uh, are at the correct locations uh, where it needs to be. We have also a communication team in Ghent. I just want to mention them here. We have Mario Gaetan and Shana van Blare who are also posting things on uh, what is happening and that's also what you will see. So please share this because it's important for the different partner universities that they are aware on the fact that uh, something is happening right here in Faro. Good. Let me go back to the schedule. Schedule, so that's the schedule of today. Where are we now? Uh, I'm right now at the practical arrangements uh, uh, and Q&A in the Grande Auditorio. And um, then after this, while you, the, the ones that do the professional practice, the first uh, exhibition are setting up, I would like to have the evaluators, all the ones that will evaluate the teachers here uh, in this auditorium that they, uh, just before the professional exhibition starts, yeah, that we just get together, that we can go through the different uh, criteria to make sure that everybody is evaluating on the same way, so that it's not depending uh, on your evaluator that you know what is going on. Uh, so for tonight, we have between um, 6 and uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, we have the first professional practice exhibition. So please pass by, witness, talk, network. And at 8 o'clock, we have uh, dinner in the university restaurant. Yeah? After dinner, make sure yeah, you finish your dinner in time, because then uh, the bus departs towards the hostels. Yeah? That means once you're on the bus, I will be so happy that I don't have to see you anymore from tonight on. No, I'm joking. Yeah, uh, I'm just saying uh, what you do then afterwards, what you do tonight is fully up to you. It's not that we have also a scheduled program yeah, from, from 8 o'clock onwards, for example. Fully up to you. Good. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is an important day. It's Tuesday. Um, at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock sharp, 
The bus is leaving, so that means the engine goes on and it's starting to ride. Yeah, means also in Portugal, you're not allowed to jump on riding buses. So what I want to say with this, please be in time. Yeah, be on the bus before it leaves because else you will not be here, of course. Um, so you will be able to pick up uh, breakfast at the hostel and therefore you receive those tiny tags. Yeah, we made sure that they're tiny so you can put them actually wherever you want to put them. Yeah, you can even fold them and put them in your rear. Yeah, uh, they will stay uh, safely there. Um, so the breakfast and then you can actually, once you have arrived here at the uh, campus, you can then uh, take your breakfast before actually the workshops are starting. Workshops, we have a whole series of workshops in the morning, yeah. The exact rooms for every workshop, as same as the list of who is uh, registered for what, yeah, will be circulated by email and WhatsApp. So you are tomorrow morning, you are in the place you're expected to be. Important, try to bring your laptops to most of the workshops, it's important. There's a hackathon, for example, there is other things that will work with data. Yeah, bring your laptops if you have them with you, yeah. Very important. Uh, in the morning, we have also a board meeting uh, from the, with, with some of the teachers. So that's, uh, yeah, we have a coffee break and then the workshops continue. Good. Lunch at 12 o'clock. This is all in the app as well, eh? so there's nothing surprising. Yeah. And in the afternoon, we have again another series of workshops, different topics, different teams, again, uh, where you can, again, participate. It's a, you will see that it's going from ethics to ecosystems uh, uh, restoration to scientific drawing, so really making nice pictures on how you do this. So it's, it's a lot of different uh, things that we organize in the, in the afternoon. In the evening we have the second professional practice exhibition, so uh, same as tonight for example. So at six o'clock between six and, uh, and eight you will be able to witness the, se the second set of exhibitions. Good Wednesday, stress time for the uh, second year students, yeah, because then it all starts, yeah, uh, it all starts thesis presentations, and we have thesis presentations in four parallel, parallel rooms, four parallel rooms. So make sure that you know in advance which room you want to go to, because once you're in a room for a session, you stay in the room for that session. So you don't walk out and you don't, yeah, so once you're in the room for a session, you stay in the room for a session. A session is only one hour and a half, yeah, so it's, it's reasonable to, to remain seated uh, right there. Yeah? So we have a coffee break, we have uh, a thesis presentations again, lunch, afternoon, etc., etc., the same kind of things. And in the evening, we have again a professional practice exhibition, the third one. Yeah? So see these evenings, these evening moments before dinner as moments where you can interact and learn from uh, each other. Good. Thursday is a bit different. Thursday we have, uh, again, thesis presentations, still two to go. Uh, and then we have lunches. And then after lunch, yeah, there will be a first bus shuttle for the second year students. So you can say, hooray, we're free. We are released. That's true. You will be brought. The first year students are expected to stay a little bit longer because we will organize a summer school information session. Yeah, very important. And also, because all the universities are here as well, also information sessions for the third semester universities, where you will sit in small groups and discuss uh, how it is. If first year students want to join such a, a session from the second year universities and share experiences, of course, that's also uh, perfectly possible. And then in the evening, we have reserved uh, an, a space in Faro city center with drinks and with other kinds of uh, nice things uh, where uh, we have, yeah, yeah. you don't know what the nice things are, eh? Haha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where it's a, a kind of a private thing. So it's IMBRC only event yeah, in the historical city center of Faro. So we have the whole city center, we, we just yeah, booked it. Eh? Yeah. And then Friday, Friday, it's second year students only, second year students only, yeah, they have a graduation ceremony um, here in this uh, very uh, auditorium where your friends and family, for example, if you have invited them, can also, of course, join. And we close the event there with a graduation reception. And then there will be at 2 o'clock buses to the airport. So that's the schedule. 
Wait, wait for the questions. Wait for the questions. There is Wi-Fi. Hooray, hooray. Iduroom. Yeah, if you don't know what Iduroom is, then you have a problem. Yeah, so the Wi-Fi works via Iduroom or via your 4G. Thesis presentation schedule. Yeah, tonight at 22... Uh, Point 0.59, local time, local time, your presentations should be uploaded. If they're not uploaded, then you will present without the presentation, if you like this or not. So make sure you upload them according to the, the guidelines you got, well in time, not the minute before, yeah, because else this might cause problems. Yeah. If it's ready already right now, just upload it, that it's there. Yeah. We will make sure for the thesis presentations yeah, that when you enter the room and you have to present, your presentation will be ready there. Keep in mind fonts, fonts, you know, font types. If you use crazy font types that are not recognized, it may be that some things are shifted. Yeah, uh, so make sure that, that you're aware on, on, okay, how are you going to present things and that you have tested these things. You can upload also a PDF if you're more secure on that. Uh, perfectly possible. Uh, once it's uploaded, no more changes because we want to keep it fair for everyone yeah, so that it's not after two days you see that another student forgot uh, A or B, for example, that you can still improve. So tonight... 22.59, put it in your schedules maybe, or on your, your cell phones, yeah, that's the deadline uh, to uh, do it. Thesis presentations, very important again. There's a very strict schedule because we're streaming and we have people also following online. What I do I mean by strict schedules, yeah, if I'm in the room, for example, and it says starting at 10 o'clock, then 10 o'clock the first words will be said and nobody will enter anymore in that room. Just out of respect to the ones that are presenting, imagine next year, for example, you have also to, do, to present, then there's nothing more kind of worrying that people just keep on walking in and out. Um, they're streamed online, so please advertise. You can watch everything. You can, uh, your parents, your friends, your, your partners, your brothers, sisters, whatever, yeah, they can uh, ask questions and get into discussion. We also take the questions from the chats in these uh, uh, live streams as well. Um, so questions and discussions, really an invitation. Please uh, engage, and uh, the ones from the first year, for example, really question the second years, give them a hard time, because you will probably not see them anymore after this event, so there's no, nothing wrong with this. Professional practice exhibitions. I'm going fast, eh? to the point. Eh? Uh, so professional practices run from 6 o'clock onwards, means if you have your professional practice, at 6 o'clock you're ready. Yeah. So we're not setting up anything, no, 6 o'clock, you're ready. Yeah, uh, the, first, the, the second year students and other students, if you're not presenting, maybe make sure that you leave the ones that are presenting, you let them set up that over on their ease, yeah, and that you don't stress them out. 6 o'clock, we kind of officially then open the exhibitions. Yeah? There is tables, the things that you asked for as much as possible. Diana, where is Diana? Yeah, Diana is uh, uh, starting to prepare. Diana is the key person for professional practice exhibition. So if you have questions, uh, uh, you can solve it with her. The professional not evaluating the wrong person, but you, you all received the number, eh? and that's the number that we also have to enter in the, in the system in the end. Good. So uh, for the professional practice exhibitions, well, fifth, uh, five o'clock for the teachers, maybe make it 5.30, 5.30, yeah, uh, in this auditorium to go through the evaluation procedures to make sure that this uh, works well. Then, uh, from tomorrow onwards, uh, we will also have a photo exhibitions from the students that have followed the graphics design course in Ghent. Yeah? Uh, there will be uh, uh, different pictures, portfolios that they had to make that you can also evaluate and actually give feedback on. Guidelines will also follow later on in a proper way. And somebody tries to call me. was my mother, yeah. <laughs> Good. Breakfast and transport, I already mentioned. Vouchers, 
Don't lose your vouchers. If you lost your vouchers, then it means you will have some periodical starvation to go through. <laughs> yeah, uh, apparently, that's also very healthy, uh, but it's up to you. Um, also, again, the buses, the name tags, your name tags are your key. Same for the restaurant here. If you want to have food, if you don't wear this thing, yeah, no food, no allowed, not allowed on the buses. And then you have a very sad time or a happy time here in uh, Faro. Don't lose these things. Really important. Also for the final part, uh, sorry, for the final event on Thursday evening, yeah, also don't forget these things, else you will not be allowed in. Yeah, it's a closed event, and so the security and, uh, that is there will not know you by heart by then. Good. So for the workshops, to repeat again, the WhatsApp group that you're, most of you are in, yeah, there we will communicate uh, again. This workshop will be in this room, will be in this room, etc., etc. And we will also email the full overview to everyone. So you know also uh, who I should I link up with, for example, if I want to be... Uh, with, with uh, my friends in a certain workshop. You don't change your workshops registrations anymore because that's prearranged with the different workshop organizers. So, and I really invite you to be in time uh, at your uh, workshop. Voila. There is already group pictures. Ah. These are not the official ones yet. Yeah. Because the official ones, we will make sure that there is a, a logo also on it and a date stamp. So uh, if you share these things on Instagram or other kind of things, yeah, that it's clear where it comes from. That's the total picture. That's the second year, I think, if I'm correct. That's the first year uh, students. Good. Questions, burning questions. Yes. Yeah. So the buses tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning. So the buses will drop you off tonight at a certain spot in Faru, not far from the uh, hostels. That's the idea. It's not that you have to find your way to the hostels. Tomorrow morning, Rodrigo will also be at the pickup time. So Rodrigo, you know him. He will be there as well. Yeah, he will be wearing a yeah, yellow umbrella or something. I don't know. Yeah, so you will find him. Be in time. Yeah, and it will be also communicated on the WhatsApp group if there would be a last minute change. Yeah, but keep in mind maybe that you try to be at the bus location a quarter to eight rather than at eight. At eight they leave. Yeah, and putting 200 students at eight in 10 seconds on a bus is impossible. Is that answering the question? Yeah, that's answering the question. Other questions? Yes. Aha, aha. There is the app. Yeah, and there is also the schedule. So if you go to the website of IMBSC, you click on a certain thing, then you will get a detailed overview with also the links to the YouTube streams. So that's the, the, the best way. So it's in the evening, for example, it's ideal to start checking. You have these name tags. If you want to have already a chat with the person, for example, you can also interlink in this way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of course, it's possible, but you're not allowed to make any change. Yeah, well, and it, it depends a bit. It, yeah, it depends a bit. Be prepared that it's like today. You had some examples eh, on on uh, uh, presentation. You load up your thing. Yeah, be prepared. That's things that we cannot say. That's a bit depending on the session chair and also how long deliberations take after the session. So first deliberations have to be done. If they take the whole time, it can be that you have to come in and immediately present. But most people are friendly people in the program. So if you talk to them in a friendly way, yeah. But no changes will be allowed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Karim? Yeah, we will test them all as well, eh? Yeah, 
So we will test all the slides as well. So what you upload will be tested. If we see that there is a, uh, some, something not opening, yeah, then, uh, but it's not a rule that we say, yes, you can come and we can test it out. We cannot promise this. Yeah, that's live. Yeah, but not after, not after you left the campus. Eh? <laughs> so during uh, and pro and the workshops have priority. So you should be in the workshops in first place. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, the take up point, Rodrigo. I. Yeah, tonight is the first time. Actually, we never did this before. So, follow the group. <laughs> yeah, very important. Yes, other questions? Yeah. Shh. Yeah, so the presentations are streamed live. Yeah, the recordings are not being put immediately on YouTube. Every recording will be post-edited where the questions, the discussions for sure are taken out. And in case there is a ban on certain thing, if there is a, a document for certain information, for example, it sometimes happens also that we put certain presentations not online. So the discussions are never put, the recordings of the discussions are never put online because that's sometimes the embarrassing moments. Sorry? Uh, that's depending if there's specific reasons, but the consortium agreement says yeah, that they're streamed and also re the recordings are put online. Yeah. If you have specific reasons for that, then we have to check this in, in detail. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's something I have to check with. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Shh. So, can you repeat that? Sorry? Yeah. For the, pro the, the professional practice exhibitions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Your locations will be there. Yeah. Good. More questions? Yes. I didn't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. Check the website. That's the first thing. Check the app. So the ones that we are not graduating, um, so that we are not that we submitted, we are submitting the thesis at yeah. the second deadline. Um, what uh, what do we have to expect in the graduation ceremony? Yeah, in the graduation ceremony, the graduation ceremony is the only ceremony there is. Yeah. So, so are we gonna be called? Or yeah, you will not be called not to, to the film because okay. you, we don't have a diploma to give. That's that's uh, yeah, right. the, the consequence I mean, of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Even if it's not like an yeah, diploma. but it's the moment, of course. It's the moment. Yeah, where uh, I strongly encourage you to be there because else it's quite sad towards the ones that are uh, finished yeah, yeah, that no, they're I'll all be alone. There. That's yeah. For sure. And of course, <laughs> and of course, we will also say a few words on the ones that still have to finish and on the yeah. And we will show a group picture, and there will be that. Ah, you're showing kind. the picture, so we have to upload the picture then. Huh? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so don't worry, it's a ceremony, and we want it that everybody yeah, uh, kind of has a place in there. More questions? If no, uh, there's more, one more question there. Yeah. Shh. 
Can you keep the poster? We have never discussed this. I think, yes, you can keep the poster, because else we have to take it and put it somewhere in a cupboard. And, uh, yeah. Uh, you, can, you can take it and, yeah, decorate your, I don't know what room with it. Yeah. Um, good. Before, before we leave, I think my last slide was, oh yeah, okay. Uh, that's not my last slide. Anyway. Doesn't matter. Uh, before we leave, I just want to wish you again uh, a good week. Yeah, take care of each other as well. Um, do also uh, experience the best. Really go to the presentation, participate in the workshops, and be grateful to all the people that are helping out and uh, uh, so on. So those that have no first professional practice exhibition to set up, you can uh, start setting up. The others can just network a bit outside, I think, yeah. And then from six o'clock onwards, you're welcome for the first exhibition. Bye-bye. <laughs>